G'day everybody and welcome to Laws 12063 Advanced Statutory Interpretation and Legal Drafting. My name's Anthony Maranak and I'm going to be the lecturer in this course for this semester. Let's start with a basic question. Why are we here? Why are we forcing you to do a legal drafting subject at the end of your degree? Well, there's a number of reasons. First up, you might remember back in first year you would have done a subject where you spent most of your time doing statutory interpretation. These days the subject is actually called statutory interpretation. It was probably called Intro to Law B when you went through a couple of years ago. While you were doing that subject, you would have been introduced to the skills you needed as a student in order to be able to successfully read cases and successfully interpret statutes. Without those skills, you wouldn't have been able to make your way through the rest of your degree. Nowadays we accept that you've gotten this far, so you must know a little bit of a thing or two about how to read cases and how to um, interpret statutes, but it's time now for us to take those skills and advance them to the professional level. You see, fundamentally, the law is made up of words. And we as legal professionals are meant to be expert users of language. And the purpose of this course is to take you from where you are at the moment and make you an expert user of language. Some of you may well be expert users of language already. Others of you may find yourselves quite surprised at how much you take away from this course. The reason we've included this course in the degree is basically because the profession has said we have to. Firms who are hiring our graduates and the Legal Practitioner Admission Board in each state have both told the universities throughout Australia that our law graduates are going out into the field without having had sufficient expertise in statutory interpretation and in legal drafting. Now here at Central Queensland Uni we want you to be among the best law graduates when you go out into the field and what that means is that when the profession is telling us that law graduates need to improve certain skills we want to make sure that you go out the door with those skills in hand. The way that we're going to approach statutory interpretation in this course is that I figure in first year you've already had a go at approaching statutory interpretation as a reader. We want to take it further so for this course we're going to put ourselves in the position of a legal drafts person. We're going to think about how to interpret statute by thinking about how we would write statute. This allows us to practice the skills of statutory interpretation and at the same time develop high quality legal drafting skills. Why am I the person to teach this to you? Well, during the period 2004 to 2007, I was a senior officer in the Australian Senate. During that period of time, I was a legislative drafts person, drafting amendments and private senators' bills for the Greens, the Democrats, the Australian Labor Party in opposition, and pretty much anyone else who asked me to do drafting for them. Some of the statutes that I've drafted have been debated in the Chambers of Parliament. Some of the statutes that I've drafted have made their way into the statute book as law. So I guess you can say that I've done this stuff for real. It excites me and I hope by the end of the semester it excites you too. So let's get underway. During this first lecture we're not going to draft anything. Not a thing, not a sausage. One of the biggest mistakes that people make as soon as they get a new drafting exercise, whether it's a will, a contract, a statute, whatever it might be, is that they pull open a new document on their word processor and they start thinking about what they want to type. No, no, no. Before you can successfully write anything, you must spend time in preparation. So before we start drafting statute in this course, we need to spend some time talking about how we're going to prepare. Starting with the most basic question of all. What's the proposed legislation trying to do? If you think about it, every law that you've come across, with almost no exceptions, every law that you've come across in your studies as a law student, 
will have tried to do one of three things. First, it might have tried to prevent something negative from happening, what we describe as a mischief. Second, it might have tried to manage a risk. Third, it might have tried to extend a benefit. Almost all of our legislation does one of these things. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, is the statute that we're looking at trying to prevent something negative, manage a risk or extend a benefit? For a moment let's pretend our statute is trying to prevent something negative. In law we refer to that as a mischief. In this sense the word mischief doesn't just mean naughty. What it means is a mischief is anything negative that the law is trying to prevent. So I've put some examples there on the slide. An obvious example is criminal conduct. Or we might have laws that are designed to prevent disease, so quarantine laws for instance, or um, the laws that make it an offence to knowingly spread uh, certain types of disease like the HIV virus. We might see child obesity as a mischief that we might be passing laws um, to prevent, such as for instance laws about when certain types of food might be advertised on the television. Reducing traffic in the CBD, the traffic is the mischief and we might reduce traffic by changing parking arrangements or by imposing fees for the use of the CBD. Climate change is a mischief that the law might seek to prevent by imposing regulations on the use of renewable energy for instance. Divorce might be a mischief. It might be that for instance um, the requirements of marriage are changed so that married couples have less frequency of getting divorced. Um, the requirement to wait a period of one month between applying to marry and marrying might be, uh, might be regarded as a law which was created to try and reduce the mischief of divorce. Now of course when we're talking about making laws, we're inherently talking about political activities. And there's some things that one political party or one group within society will see as a mischief that another group will not see as a mischief at all. A great example is gun control. If we look at the, uh, the knots the United States of America is tying itself into at the moment about gun control, we can see that there is a great proportion of Americans who see private ownership of automatic firearms as a mischief. And there's also a great proportion of Americans who see private ownership of automatic firearms as a fundamental and basic constitutional right. So it's quite likely that people within society are not going to agree on whether something is a mischief or not. But whether we agree or not, we still should be able to look at a piece of legis legislation and say, ah, here is the mischief that that legislation is trying to prevent. The second thing legislation might try to do is manage a risk. Now a risk is kind of like a mischief, but it hasn't actually occurred yet. With a mischief we know it's there, we know it's happening. With a risk we don't know that it's happening just as yet. We're trying to stop it from happening in the first place. Best example there is road safety legislation. Now we don't know that road accidents are going to occur. In an ideal world no road accidents would occur. When we build a new road and a speed limit is set over that road, the intention in setting that speed limit is to manage the risk of motor vehicle collisions. I've got some other examples there. Quarantine programs are inherently a risk management exercise. When people bring goods in from overseas, those goods are examined in order to try and reduce the risk of foreign parasites or foreign bacteria being brought into Australia. Preventative medicine is all about managing a risk. The fact that in Queensland for many years until recently women could have free breast scans undertaken 
was all managed by legislation but it was all there in order to manage a risk the risk of women getting breast cancer and therefore needing extensive treatment and of course suffering from personal tragedy interim family violence orders are about managing a risk when somebody's placed under an interim family violence order they usually not before the court at all they might not even have any idea that the whole thing is happening until after the order has been made and it gets served on them they usually last for a very short period of time and they serve to separate the parties until they can be brought before the court so they're managing a risk they're managing the risk of further violence occurring the third type of legislation is legislation that maximizes a benefit this is a circumstance where the Parliament has said here is some, something that we want to help and we're going to pass legislation which will assist. Education programs are a great example. Recently we've seen discussions between the, the Commonwealth Government and the states about education funding. Now this of course may require legislative change in order to implement the programs that are part of that funding. The idea of increasing the benefits associated with legis with uh, education would provide the basis for legislation maximizing a benefit strangely enough though it's pretty difficult to tell the difference between legislation maximizing a benefit and legislation minimizing a mischief you see let's say we had a new piece of legislation which was targeted at child obesity and let's say that the upshot of that was that every child in Australia was going to be given a $1,000 voucher each year which would enable them to pay membership fees and purchase equipment to enable the child to play organized sport now is this a piece of legislation that is intended to maximize the benefit of having a healthy population or is this a piece of legislation designed to minimize the mischief of childhood obesity they're two sides of the one coin so what I'm saying here is don't get too locked up in the idea that a piece of legislation is going to do only one of these things or that it can only be characterized in one way but you are going to have to think before you start drafting about what your approach is going to be do you see this as a piece of legislation maximizing a benefit or minimizing a mischief how is that going to change the way in which you structure the leg legislation and place legal obligations upon those who are required to obey the law that you're drafting once you've got that basic idea in your head you know what the law in general is supposed to accomplish the next thing you're going to have to do is a whole bunch of reading you see it's very rare in these days for a new piece of law to be able to stand on its own inevitably a new statute will become part of a, a web of other statutes it will affect and will be affected by statutes in all sorts of places um, in the statute book so in order to understand what your new piece of legislation is going to do you're going to have to go into the statute book and say what other legislation is similar what other legislation operates in this area what other legislation should I be reading in order to understand what sort of impact I'm going to have on um, the rest of the statute book let's take an example let's say you were re required to draft a new piece of legislation making it unlawful to discriminate against people with a disability now I know that there's already legislation that says it's unlawful to discriminate against people with a disability but go with me here anyway in order to write that you would want to spend some time first saying what other legislation out there on the statute book already relates to people with a disability what other legal obligations is the community already under in relation to people with a disability you might then also say what other discrimination legislation is there out there because we want to try and make sure that our new piece of discrimination legislation fits in with the rest of the scheme out there once you've identified the statutes you might also then be asking what is there in the common law are there any common law uh, 
principles of law that I ought to be taking note of here. Have there been any key cases interpreting some of these statutes that I've been looking at? What has the High Court said about those statutes and the way they operate? What do I need to know in order to ensure that my new statute does not have a significant impact on the rest of the law being an impact that I wasn't expecting to have? By the time you come to write a new piece of statute, you should have reached a point of expertise about the surrounding law. I once had a discussion with a senator who asked me to draft a piece of legislation relating to immigration. It was a very short piece of legislation in the end, only three or four paragraphs. But it took me nearly four weeks to draft, and the senator wanted to know why. I sat down with him and showed him the notes that I'd made, which came to about 200 pages worth of notes, to show the extent to which I had had to understand the surrounding body of law to make sure that the piece of legislation that we were about to try and implement didn't muck things up somewhere else that we hadn't even started thinking about. Once you've done that, once you've worked out whether you're uh, preventing a mischief, managing a risk or enhancing a benefit and then you've thought about the surrounding body of law you can start to think about other aspects of the law which will also affect your statute. So you go beyond the statutes and you start looking at things like constitutional principles, charters of rights, international obligations. These are things that are not necessarily going to be affected by your new piece of statute but they form part of the statutory environment that you have to be taking note of. The final thing you should be doing is looking to other jurisdictions. Quite often you'll find that somewhere else in the world, some other jurisdiction has passed or tried to pass legislation very similar to the, to the legislation that you're trying to pass now. Sometimes that will provide a good model, sometimes it won't provide a good model. But it provides you at least with food for thought. Once you've done all of these things, you're starting to get fairly close to being sufficiently prepared to start writing. The final thing you've got to do is something that you've been doing ever since first year. You've got to apply the facts to the law. Unfortunately, when you're drafting statute, applying the facts to the law is a whole lot harder than it is when you're simply reading statute or dealing with a problem case. You see, to this point in your studies, we've taught you the law, and then from time to time you've been presented with problems, where we've laid out a fact situation and said, we need you to make reasonable advice based on this fact situation. Now that's relatively easy, because you've got one fact situation to apply. When you're drafting statute, however, that statute might have to operate in dozens, hundreds, perhaps even thousands of different circumstances. You might write a law that is going to operate absolutely perfectly in exactly the circumstances that you're expecting and might not operate in a sensible way at all if something happens that makes you uh, that that if something happens that was outside your expectations when you first started drafting. Let me give you an example. It's one of the, my favourite examples that I use uh, um, in various contexts. A long time ago, I think late 1970s, the sport of powerlifting was um, very popular. And there was a, uh, a powerlifting champion who had got into powerlifting after he had um, lost both of his legs in a car accident. So powerlifting is essentially bench pressing but bench pressing very heavy weights. And this powerlifting competitor wanted to compete at an elite level against people who 
um, were not amputees. Initially he wasn't able to do so because one of the rules of that elite level competition was that every competitor had to be wearing approved gym shoes. This competitor of course couldn't wear gym shoes for the very simple reason that he didn't have any feet. You can see there there's a situation where a rule has been written with certain fact situations in mind and there just hasn't been any thought given to what fact situations might emerge outside those expectations. So once you've started to come up with a legislative scheme what you really need to do is run a whole bunch of different fact scenarios from the very likely to the very unlikely and ask yourself how would the law apply in each of these scenarios. You might start to see very quickly that the law which looked good on first uh, or at, on your first planning is actually going to be inadequate. Start asking yourself how would this law operate if the people who are subject to the law didn't speak English as a first language. Does this law require things like internet access and how do people obey it if they don't have internet access? What are the costs of compliance going to be for this law and are they reasonable? What are people going to do if they struggle to comply? You can see that by running different fact scenarios you start to suddenly realize that the law needs to be chipped and changed in order to make it operate across a broader range of circumstances. Once you've done those three things you've worked out the purpose of the law you've taken sufficient time to look at the surrounding body of law and then you've applied the facts to the law you're pretty much ready to start writing. And that's what we're going to be doing next week. There's a couple of other things I want to talk about before we finish up this week though. The first one is I'd like to talk about precedents and proformers. Some of you have probably worked in legal firms already either doing some um, work experience or internship or you may uh, have been already working as a paralegal or in some other similar role um, before getting to this point in your studies. If you've done that then you're probably listening to the first part of this lecture thinking look all this is well and good Anthony but nobody actually writes things from scratch. Everybody goes where's our pro forma for this and people take those pro formas they adjust them according to the circumstances and that's how they draft legal documentation. So for instance if you're working in a firm and you're asked to draft a will you're not necessarily going to draft a will from scratch. You're going to start with the firm's basic wills pro forma and then you're going to amend it according to the instructions of your client. I want to start by saying I know. I know how that works and I know that um, not only do private firms have their own precedents but there's also some excellent, some really excellent precedent guides and precedent books out there. For the purpose of this course though I want you to ignore them. It's almost like having that conversation that you, you might have had with your own kids or with your parents when you were at high school where the kid says I don't really need to learn my times tables because I can just use a calculator. Well yes you can use a calculator but you can use a calculator far more effectively if you have the basic skills in hand yourself. And so the purpose of this course is to give you those basic skills. You'll probably end up using precedents and pro formas quite a bit in practice, but you'll use them much more intelligently if you've had to go through the process of writing documents from scratch yourself. Furthermore, the uncritical use of precedents and pro formas can get you into a whole lot of trouble because when you're using a precedent or a pro forma, What's really happened is that somebody else has done most of the thinking for you. And that means that your document can only be as good as their thinking. If you're not critically thinking about the precedent, 
and critically thinking about how it should operate in the particular circumstances that you find yourself in there's a very great danger that you're going to end up drafting something that's completely inadequate so what I've said there in the in the uh, slide is that precedents are wonderfully useful in the hands of a prudent and sensible person and are terribly dangerous in the hands of fools this week you have three tutorial problems altogether they'll probably take somewhere between one and perhaps three or four hours to do what you'll see in the notes is that we've received an email from a client the client is an insurance company and they've just been paying out an awful lot of money as a result of floods one of the things that they want to stop is paying out money for people who lose motor vehicles because those people were stupid enough to drive into floodwaters and what they're asking for is for your firm to draft legislation which would make it an offence to drive a motor vehicle into floodwaters now I don't actually want you at this stage to start drafting that legislation what I would like you to do is first respond to the clients email now when you're responding to the clients email what I want you to do is show me that you have undertaken that preparation process show me that you understand the clients objective show me that you've done some research and that you've assessed the surrounding body of law that might be law in relation to liability public liability it might be law in relation to negligence it might be law in relation to motor vehicle use there might be other disaster related laws that you look at have a look around in the statute book and see what you can come up with and finally I'd like you to show some idea of how what, what statutory changes might be necessary in order to bring this about so for instance would you amend a piece of legislation which is already in place or would you write something completely new if you would amend something what would you amend and in general terms how the second exercise I want you to undertake this week gives more practice in identifying the surrounding body of law I've given five options there first is a proposal to accept all asylum seekers who arrive on mainland Australia second is a proposal to specifically outlaw discrimination against redheads the third is a proposal to allow same-sex marriage fourth is a proposal to reduce the voting age to 16 and fifth is a proposal to prohibit police from giving chase to a fleeing vehicle take one of those and start by thinking about what are the areas of law that impact on that policy question once you've identified those areas of law I would like you to be able to give an appreciation a brief assessment of which laws are likely to affect or be affected by a law which is going to meet the objective listed there the third exercise I'd like you to do this week is run through one of the provisions listed I've got a provision from the Neighbourhood Disputes Resolution Act one from the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act one from the Witness Protection Act one from the Defence Act and one from the Food Act pick one of those and identify what the purpose of that section is does it prevent a mischief does it manage a risk does it maximize a benefit and then once you've worked that out identify me for me which mischief is prevented which risk is managed or which benefit is maximized now bear in mind that there may not be a right answer to this because there may be great similarity between a mischief that's being prevent prevented and a benefit that's being maximized once you've completed these exercises you've got two options you can either uh, uh, complete them just for your own benefit and assess them for your own benefit or if you'd like you're perfectly welcome to post them to the bulletin board um, to the Moodle site and I'll jump on and have a look and and give an appreciation 
of what's been done well and what's been done poorly. Um, what I would prefer not to do is have you send them to me individually unless you have particular question about one of the pieces of one of the exercises that you're doing. The reason is that look I don't think that it's a good idea to teach by embarrassment and I certainly wouldn't be out to embarrass anybody even if there's quite a bit of feedback that's required in relation to anyone's submission. However I think the best way for us all to learn is collaboratively by not only thinking about what we're writing but by observing what others are writing. So I hope some of you have the uh, the confidence and the courage to post some of this stuff up on, on the uh, website and I'll be more than glad to have a look and provide you with some feedback. That's the end of this short lecture to start week one and I'll look forward to talking further when we get to week two.